from around the world. This is Heather Lockie with Lasting Conversations, and we are absolutely going global today with the beautiful and amazing Ranjana Maria Venegard. Hi there. How are you today? I'm amazing. How are you? Very, very well. So we literally just met yesterday morning at a little mini uh, networky thing in Florida, and our eyes just met in terms of there was just this beautiful connection. So we each have our soul paths and our soul paths are about helping people and knowing, uh, for me, it's about offering resources and that sense of calm for people to know that there are others around this world that have your back and can help you if you need some help. So uh, Ranjana is here to share her wisdom and resources for topics that we have yet to cover on Lasting Conversations, which is adoption and foster care and some other things. We're going to also talk about emotional fitness and parenting and being from one country, being raised in another country and all these amazing things. So Ranjana has a beautiful book called One Voice, Empowering Life Lessons about adoption. And the premise is about adoption and the journey about that. So welcome again, and please share. Thank you, Heather. And thank you for inviting me to this uh, podcast, Lasting Conversation. I'm really uh, honored to be here. And it was such uh, a beautiful um, meeting we had yesterday morning yeah. and i'm so uh, blessed to have met you and um, thank you for bringing me in today on your podcast so my name is ranjana i was born in india um back in 1972 and i came to denmark when i was eight months old to my danish family my parents had three siblings before they adopted me my father went to india back in the 60s driving all the way from Copenhagen to India to visit the country and, um, you know, build a hospital uh, with a missionary out there. And then he decided that he wanted to adopt an, a girl from India. So my parents started the process back in 1970 to adopt me. So I arrived in 1972 in November. And, and did, uh, just, I'm sorry, I want to ask a very quick question. So with that planning, was this an actual planned adoption with your birth family or they just, that process took that long um, and they didn't know the birth family? My birth family didn't know. I was born in a hospital, Kama Hospital, uh, Atlas in Mumbai. And I spent one month there and I assumed I was spending that month with my mother and then I was giving up for adoption. And then I was taken to something called Elizabeth Nursing Home, where I spent the rest of my time until my court papers was okay to be adopted. I was supposed to come three months earlier, but something was uh, not finalized with my, my papers. So they had to wait a little bit more, my family, to pick me up in the airport. Beautiful, beautiful. So I'm sorry for that interruption, but it's just felt, um, as I know people who have adopted internationally, so there's so many ins and outs to the whole thing. And um, how we all each start in this world is is very important. So thank you for that. And so and then you're brought to Denmark, of all amazing places. Yes. So I grew up in a small town of 22,000 inhabitants in in uh, a little bit north from Copenhagen and that was um I had a beautiful childhood uh, my parents were very loving and my sibling as well I grew up in a class um I think we were very fortunate and I think they tried to avoid where we were looking different like have a different color so there were three classes in our level and one of them which I was in we were two other adoptees and there was two other people from Israel. And we were all put into one class. And I think that made us, you know, feel comfortable and safe because we were all different. But it, it, it created a safe space, right, in the class. We were not feeling so lonely, right? If there was only one child that was different, right? So that mm -hmm. made the very comfortable for us to growing up. So I wouldn't say that in my childhood I experienced, uh, as I write in my book, about uh, racial uh, challenges that I, you know, had more when I actually left school, basically. So, um, 
that that so this been a very very uh, transparent uh, race in Denmark when I was a child. It was first when I became into the teenage age. Things changed for me. While yeah. you were in, still in Denmark, or had you moved on to another country or something in terms of what you're speaking about in your teenage years? Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't uh, move to another country. Uh, but something happened to me when I was 13 years old, and my parents have been always giving. They always paid for children in a third country for the education and and you know etc. So we invited a. Um, an immigrant to, you know, to, to learn about the Danish society, learn about, you know, Danish culture. And that man took advantage of me when I was 13 years old, and he sexually assaulted me uh, one night. That changed my life forever. I was, I was really wondering why my, nobody asked me the day after how I was feeling. I don't remember anyone asking me that. And that created, like, a silent voice for me, and I was never taken to in a psych- psychiatrist, a psychologist to speak about it. And I was just feeling so ashamed and dirty, and you know, I didn't really know what to do or think and express myself. So it took me 40 years to speak about it. And did your family know at the time, or it, it really was a silent voice that nobody knew? Nope. They no my I when it happened that night my I I ran when I escaped then I ran down and told my parents right away and they okay took the guy away from the house uh, my father and my brother drove him to the town where he was the immigration center where he was at and dropped him nearby and since we didn't hear anything about him but nobody really talked about it ever since. Uh- I see. I see. Well, at least he was out of that house. But I so I understand that context. And yeah. so after your 40 years or, you know, the continued journey of finding your voice and purpose and passion. Yeah, so I met, you know, that life happens for a reason, right? Right. And back in 2010, I had an accident in Bangkok. While I was in pain, laying in my bed and couldn't move, they drove me around in the hotel in the wheelchair. I was thinking, there got to be something more in life. There got to be something deeper than just going to work every day, seven days a week or five days a week, what we do. So I started like exploring personal development, and the, my first mentor was Bob Proctor. Mm-hmm. And I took his coaching course, and that led me to my my biggest mentor in my life, which was uh, Tony Robbins. And that was back in 2013. And that opened up my my whole soul to not only heal the wound from being sexually assaulted, and but it also opened up to personal development and and really dive into you know who am I, you know, who am I today? Who can I become as a person, you know, and Mm -hmm. finding the blessing in being adopted because I was having all those sorts and feelings being adopted. You know, I had all the limiting beliefs, patterns that we can have as adoptees, like rejection, abandonment that we take in our life in different life stages from, you know, when we are a child, but also teenage age, when we're in school, when we, you know, grow up when we are in the, you know, 20s and 30s. So it opened up for me to see that it was a blessing. It was not a rejection, an abandonment. No, it's a blessing and gift to come into this life as an adoptee. Beautiful. So within the context of adoption and being um, an adoptive child, what are some of the things, and for people who are listening, um, and I'm sure you you have these points in your book, but what are some of maybe the signs or um, sadnesses, if you will, questions even, um, that might perhaps present as, is there something missing? Is there something missing in me or what has happened um, from the aspect of being an adoptive person? Yeah, so I think what is missing, I mean, I was born in 1972, and that time, 
there was no support system, right? There was mm -hmm. not like an adoption. There was an adoption agency, but they were, had not built some kind of support system. So it was like, okay, this is your adopted child, you know. There, there was some cow. They came visit us, you know, the first three years, but we didn't have like a daily contact to an adoption agent to really follow the process mm -hmm. and ask questions. There were no support system. So parents at that time did not have the tools to actually know how to raise their children, how to speak to their children. I was having, I was giving untraditional love, but even that, I didn't love myself because mm -hmm. I was feeling the abandonment and rejection from my mother because she gave me up for adoption, right? I felt she didn't want me, she didn't like me, and for that reason gave me up. So when you are talking about giving birth to a child and you are taking the child away from the birth mother, is creating a wound not only the adoptees but also in the birth mother. So it even happens before the the the, the child is birth given birth to right because there will be conversation. I have subconscious mind limiting belief based on the conversation my mother and my birth father had before she gave birth to the child that created you know, a subconscious mindset within me about who I am, what I am as an adoptee. But when you're taking away a child from their mother, it creates a wound, but also uh, limiting beliefs of, you know, of, of not loving yourself. Because when you're give, when, like, when you are a parent and you're having a child, there's a nurturing love. We mm -hmm. don't get the same nurturing love. I didn't have that with the first seven months of my life because I was in a nursing home. It was not the same love, nurturing love that was given by my mother when she, she got me in Denmark, right? Then I received the, the self-love and, you know, nurturing love from my mother. But it, it, it changed your life in different life stages, how it's going to affect you, you know, subconsciously. So, mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Uh, subconsciously, the way you you think and feel, and you start thinking about you know you. I felt different, right? When it's international adoption, mm -hmm. and the parents have a child that is having a different color, I felt the difference within my siblings, and that always made made me not feel like whole part of a family because I felt different. I felt different the way I was thinking. You know the the way I was behaving. Like I was not I was not like the same as my my siblings at all, right? So it was first when I I was asking myself all those questions. You know why I'm coming? You know why do I look different? Why do I have a different color than my siblings? I was asking my mother all those questions, and it was first when I went to India with my adoptive parents. I actually could see the personalities I I had, and you know some of my things that I saw was very beautiful about myself, the way I was thinking, I could see that when I came to India because I could see how the Indian culture was. Right. So I could kind of, I, that was the moment where I started really accepting myself. And here I'm talking about self-acceptance that we don't have as an adoptee because we don't love ourselves. You know, so this is also beautiful and fascinating. And I know each um, adoption journey is so very different. And so one of the things you're talking about is that core sense of being. And even if, say, our mothers and that whether we're adopted or not, you know, where where we're where we are in our womb and our mothers, how they're feeling, it literally affects us. And there are research and and medicine that can bear that out. So if we are kind of steeped in maybe shame and guilt or these things that are not joyful exactly, um, we, we carry that. So that's one piece. Um, and as I know somebody who did um, adopt, uh, put her child up for adoption as a very young person, and although it was difficult at the time, she was so centered in herself and full of love that she gave in love and that, but that's just who she is. So we all have different flavors of this scenario, but going to the other big piece of what you're talking about in terms of our own personal wholeness is the cultural aspect is the, where am I from? 
And, yes. you know, whether it, it, it does matter, our skin tones and fitting in or not, and it can even feel, um, but it's also universal, universal from, well, I can pick up, well, maybe my German history. Oh, does that make sense to me? And we all really love making sense to ourselves as part of my own exploration and family history is, oh, well, maybe this aspect of me, now I make sense to myself and I'm not crazy. <laughs> and therefore I can now reframe how I'm feeling internally, right? If we understand. So then taking from a bigger cultural context, such as yours, it's huge. It is, it is, yeah. And there's so many things. I just remember how it was growing up, right? It was it was beautiful, but I had so many difficulties with relationship, you know, right. relationship with with other people, with friends, you know, finding my first love. You know, I was craving for love, right? right. And I stayed in that I the first relationship that I had. I was craving for love and I admit that today and I can see the circumstances under that relationship, but it ended up being an abusive alcoholic relationship with the person I was dating. And it, I stayed there too, too much time because I was craving so much for love and I right. was afraid to let him go because uh, who else is going to love me the rest of my life, right? You know, that was right. my source that I was thinking at that time. So I ended up going to a psychiatrist because, because that was the only way for me to get out of the, the relationship. And that's the self-love, you know, the nurturing love that I'm talking about. They can create so much, I would use the words damage, because mm -hmm. it create, you know, more wounds within your soul to heal when things like that happen. And... So yes, and we'll just pause on that. Yes, you know, these are the wounds that be, can be created. And I'll also circle back to what you were just saying and where are the gifts in that and where we get to learn more and more deeply about ourselves um, and our fellow human beings, really, with, with these things. So um, going into maybe the emotional fitness and the blessings that are hidden behind these things, um, let's, speak, let's speak to that. Yeah, so my journey with Tony Robbins has been taking me on a deeper, you know, soul journey within myself right. Right. and releasing and learning how to accept, you know, the circumstances, but also the limiting beliefs and patterns that I have, but also self-confidence within myself. Mm -hmm. And today I had to learn about the limiting beliefs and really put words on them in order for me to actually heal from them, you know, and really work. So I have done a lot of my, the tools that I use to heal from wounds as an adoptee is I use forgiveness, which is my, my major component that I incorporate in my coaching Mm -hmm. is the whole Ho'oponopono prayer. I don't know if you know it, Heather. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So that I, I learned back in, in 2016. Right. And, oh, no, sorry, it's 2013. I met when I met Tony on, on did uh, a very, very deep uh, soul journey with him at Date with Destiny that he has. And that just, the forgiveness in the rejection and the abandonment, forgiving my birth mother, of giving me up for adoption. I forgave her for all of that, mm -hmm. but I have used the forgiveness process also in terms of the man that I was dating for the abusive relationship, but I've also forgave my the sexual assault that I had when I was 13 years old. If you ever asked me 20 years ago or 30 years ago if that's something I would forgive, I would say no. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's just, just there's no words for what we're going through or what it creates for us when we experience things like that as a woman or somebody's being raped. You know, it creates a wound for the rest of our life, and we will never forget that day. And that's just uh, the forgiveness is, is such a it it create neural brain wave. You know, it 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 heals the neural the neural brain. Uh, in in the um, in the brain the, the the neuro sorry 
um, <clears throat> it it changes the neural pathway in the brain in order for us to really heal when we use the whole Puna Puna prayer. Absolutely. So- and so these forgiveness pieces, and it was very important that you said we're not forgetting. We're not, we're not excusing. No. We are, and yet the the energy behind opening our heart enough to say, oh, okay. The the forgiveness piece really is massive. And and that Hopo and Ono is very is very special actually because it covers a lot of bases. You know, we th- we thank you and you know, I, I love you and I'm sorry, but you it's infused in such love for for self yeah. and other. And again, not to excuse, nope. but offering offering that space. We were just mentioning it on the show the other day about with Nelson Mandela. If we hold hatred and and disharmony and disease about the other, yeah. your jailer or whoever it is, then we're continuously going to be in our own jails, aren't we? Yes. And what I want to add to it is, if we can forgive, we can move forward. And Correct. Will, we right? break free. There's the freedom. We break the freedom. We're breaking to break free. free. That's yeah, we're right. breaking. Free from the pain and suffering we are experiencing. That's right, and that that's across the board. And we don't even have to be physically jailed, or even um, you know the physical manifestations of abuse are horrific. And then there's the emotional and and other other facets of what jail can feel like, or where we feel um, disempowered and unseen and unheard, et cetera, et cetera. We can rabbit hole the whole thing. But these are all those mini jails and major jails, really. So in the forgiveness aspects and the other tools that I'm sure you'll talk about, that is, those are our invitation. Those are the keys to unlock our very core, to remember our magnificence and empowerment and make fresh decisions, right? That's where exactly. our, we can walk on and walk in light and know that we're okay and let other other people go on their own way exactly yeah and and also but you know we will really unlock our true potential why right? because we, right. we become our true self why right? we we, be, right. we build up the self-acceptance that we need you know because the, it's taking away from us why right? you know to accept ourselves in that way that accept that it happened actually and then we can actually move forward with the forgiveness Right. Without actually, we're not trying to eliminate what happened, like you were saying, but we right. just try to to move forward, you know, with the best potential and unlock the future, right? Absolutely. So speaking of future, which is your present right now, what is it that you are are doing and what is your passion right now? Um, is it you, you've been a coach and um, you've worked with a a motivator for adoptive families, uh, foster care, et cetera, et cetera. So let's bring it into what is it that is jazzing you right now? So what's jazzing me right now is that I came back two years ago from a Tony Robbins event and I was trying in California and I was thinking, Tony is a big mentor for me, right? And he impacted millions of lives, you know, through his 50 years of teaching what he's teaching. And I was thinking, if I want to do one-on-one coaching for the rest of my life, I'm not going to impact enough lives in my life. So I was thinking in out of the box, I was thinking, how can I impact the world on a much higher scale that I want to do by collaborating with other people? So therefore, my my thoughts and desire is to create an emergency call center for adoptees here and foster care here in the United States where they have a support system, they will, uh, yeah, it's going to be a place where you can find all the adoption lawyers, psychiatrists, you know, counselors, but it has to have an emergency call number where they can get the support that they need. And also because sometimes they experience, you know, abuse, especially in the foster care system, because okay. there's so many right now, there's 20% of the, 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 they're aging out right now in the, in the foster care that are becoming homeless. They will be in the street and they will be taking advantage of. Most of them are actually becoming sick trafficking children today to survive their daily life. 
Well, there's mm-hmm. something. Let, let's just talk about this for a little bit. Um, and there's another person that we met yesterday that she works with um, people on the street and the sex trafficking and, you know, that that whole side of, of life that is um, it can be quite tragic because when somebody has feels if they feel they have they are disempowered and they have nowhere to go, that is exactly where someone can be preyed upon. So the, the notion of having those kinds of resources, um, and so let's talk about more about that, where people can feel, that, again, that they're seen, they're heard, there's another choice to be had. But what is it about our foster care system, the aging out, um, for people who don't know what aging out actually means? Aging out means that when they're turning 18 years old, they are no longer part of the foster care system. So if you don't have a foster care family that's helping them or taking care of them, they will be aging out or not getting any more support. Right. Yeah. And therefore, if they haven't had those, the structures and the, the ladder to success as a person, you know, being raised from zero to 18 years old, if you're an 18 year old with nobody, without that structure to know about job and education and you're literally you can be kicked out and and become homeless that's a that's a major problem and kind of very surprising really in the United States but and and you're thinking globally as well that and again getting into the sex trafficking this is a massive global industry which is mm, 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 mm. so Talk to us more about your mission because it feels like you're creating the resources. First of all, the resource from within, right? From within to say that's enough and there's got to be a better way. There is a better way. And and, and I I want to create something that is really strong here in the United States. We'll be talking about plus 400,000 in the foster care system that are there. And we are talking about over 2 million adoptees here in the United States of America. Right. Yeah, there's a, and I, I, I have talked to many different, you know, adoptees and foster care parents, and they, they all express the same thing, and they say there's no support system, right? And even though if you have a, a beautiful family that have no children that they want to adopt a child, the court system in the United States makes it so difficult and the foster care system makes it so difficult for the parents actually to have that child. And I'm like, we're sitting here with children with no family, and we're sitting with a family that actually want a child. Why do we make it difficult for that to happen, for that child to have a family? Why we we have to be, you know, more open to communication and dive deeper into adoption. I know for a fact in Denmark right now, there's a bit of support that we you, we have now, but that we didn't have 10, 20 years ago. And I think right now in the United States is hitting a, a critical point in the system, but also for adoptees here in the United States. And that's why, you know, I would love, and I can see myself talking to the, to the, the you know to Washington D.C. you know the government about this or United Nations here in the United States of America because it is a critical point right now and someone has to do something someone has to start you know collaborating or finding a solution for them and I feel like I want to take that road I want to take that map and and lay it out to people that I collaborate with. So that's also my, if there's somebody sitting here listening to your podcast right. that knows somebody, but it's all about the connections. It's all about the relationship we have with other people. But sometimes it only takes one person to actually make it happen, right? I'm the creator, I'm the brain behind this, but I feel it's something that can serve the United States, but also worldwide. I already talked with somebody that built a an emergency line for uh, incest, and she built it for six years, just as a nonprofit here in the United States, and it's very successful today. And she built up a system, so I'm also collaborating with him because this is not about me. It's mm-hmm. not about me 
taking that pride to to create this. No, it's the difference we can make for those that need help, the support they need, right? So they can get a life and, and, and live a life fulfilling, right? That's that's the mindset behind why I want to create it. So I can impact, you know, thousands of people of life or millions of people of life here in the United States. And they can be a global one. She made it globally, the incest line. So people could call from anywhere in the world and book a session and have support. Beautiful. The the things that are bigger than us. This is this is it's not about you. This show is not about me. This this is about reaching as many people to touch their heart and then offer the resources when their hearts are broken and and they're not feeling empowered. So I love this vision and to have something um, a way to a way to show the way. So you're thinking of an app, you're thinking of, aside from changing some laws and things, which is massive, and you're right, the next yeah. right person needs to hear what um, what's really going on and how to make that change. But for this now, um, you've started with your book, The Empowering Life Lessons About Adoption. I'm sure there's beautiful resources within there as well. Um, and now next level is an actual app or phone number to create. Um, so tell us more about the app, the, your vision for it. Mm-hmm. So the app that I want to create is going to have not only just a phone line, you know, it's also going to be, you know, a guide in there for, because I'm also connecting people together. Right. And I want to have, have the parents connecting to the child or wishing to have a child. So I want to have a, a guide in there also for the parents who connect you know, within that app. So to find the adoption agency, you know, find the adoption lawyer, whatever they need in which state, sometimes that can be very overwhelming. It can be very stressful because they're going through a lot of chess to be able to be a foster family, for example. Right. So I want to- Right, because the parents need the the help as well. So the kids and and older uh, adoptees need assistance, but the parents who are in that trench and they might be feeling um, confused or down a road they're not sure of themselves. So again, you, you, that you've addressed the parental side too is, is very beautiful and important. Yeah. And the emergency phone number is for, of course, for the person that need it, right? For an emergency, right. but to get the support they need. So that can be counselors, it could be psychologists, it could be, you know, psychiatrists that's working in that phone line, you know, and then, you know, people can, you know, just call and get the support that they want to. So that's the three components because I also want to, you know, help the critical part we have in the United States for the, the, the children that is aging out of the foster care system to actually have, be able to have a family. Beautiful. So where within all of this um, is that message of hope? Um, the word continuity somehow is coming out in terms of the continuity of, of life and knowing that you're going to be okay. Here are some resources. So the message of that remembrance of our own light and our souls, speak to us as we kind of round through the conversation about that light and about that um, soul recovery, the uncovering of our magnificence. Um, I know you mentioned about emotional fitness and life to the next level. Let's take that life to the next level. We, you mentioned that just before we started recording. So talk about the next level. The next level for me is about feeling fulfilled mm-hmm. and feeling home in ourselves. And I was in Mexico in 2022 where I would I was taking on a deeper level to have trust, faith, and believe in myself. That there's a higher source, there's a higher, you know, it can be, I don't know what people believe in, but there can be the universe, it can be God, you know, it can be a higher source, whatever we call it. For me, it was finding that trust and that faith that no matter what step I take, I will always have the support and love and confidence within myself to trust that I can take the next step and having faith that I'll be feel, feeling safe and secure in that. And that would, I would say it's taken me 52 years to get to that point to mm-hmm. fully have that trust, faith and believe in myself. 
And now I can say to myself, yeah, I belong, but where do I belong? Do I belong to a culture? Do I belong to a country? Or do I belong to a family? I believe that we have to tell ourselves that we belong in home, feeling home in ourselves. That's the fulfillment that I want to talk about. That that's what I want to see for people. Because when we feel that way, is is feeling peace and sincere and in ourselves, in our soul, and that would enlighten the future for us. You know, that would unlock the potential of living a fulfilling life today. When we get to that point, that's what I want to create for people. And I have something in my. I haven't spoken about it yet. I have something in my coaching that's called the Love Triad, and it's it's standing. L stands for love, O stands for oneness, V stands for victory, and then E stands for empowerment. And that's my ground pillars of my coaching that I want to create because that will give people the fulfillment and stillness within themselves to be able to live a fulfilling life. I love that. L O V E ending with empowerment. Yeah. Yeah. That's just beautiful. Is there anything else? I just have a message to the world, you know, we're living in 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 a world just after the pandemic. We all saw what happened under the pandemic in the world. And I feel that the world needs light. And the more people that can be the light for humanity, the better the world will be. And my quote is to end this beautiful podcast here today is to be the change you want to see in the world. And I, mm-hmm. I live it, I breathe it every day, and that's who I am and who I became. And that's the difference that I want to make in the world. Perfect. And and the saying, the phrase might seem cliche, but it's literally the core of everything. We are that, right? Yeah. It, it's not the next savior of the world. We we are that. And and so beautiful folks like yourselves are offering these you're offering your light and love and understanding and then resources for people that are feeling a certain way and aren't ready quite yet, or maybe they are ready. That That's just it too. People who are listening to the show, if you're listening, you know that you are ready. If you're break, needing to break free of aspects of yourselves that are holding you back, this is why you're even listening here and, and not some other show. But um, Ranjana, Thank you so, so much. And I know we really could keep talking because we just when we get to this broader level, mm-hmm. I know I joked with my friend Peggy, who's, who's on the previous show, we get to that wordless space, right? The yeah. space where everything is possible. I think you've worked yeah. with Dr. Joe Dispenza as well. And, you know, you get to that field, you get to that field of capacity and yeah. love and, and, and enjoyment. So but I'm, can I add something? And before please we please do, please do. I know there was something else. I know we were we're we're rounding finish line, but I knew it. Thank you. Please go. Yes. So I have a saying, or it's not only me that's saying that. The thing is actually coming from different kind of mentor is that when the student is ready, yes, the teacher will appear. Correct. And what I mean by that, for my own case and an adoptee, it means that you're ready to take the next step when you're ready to open that part of the chapter of your life yeah. to go to the next level. So speaking about the next level is also by being ready, but for somebody that is not ready, I'm only able to help them to a certain point. Yep. And then they ha- I have to wait or they have to wait till they're, o- they're ready to open up for the next level in yep. life. Right. And that's, I mean, people say to me, oh, you've been to 38 events with Tony Robbins. But every time that I go to an event, I peel off another layer within myself that is ready to go. Yep. I let go of. Yep. So the power of letting go is, you know, when we're ready to let it go and it will come, We, we will be ready. I can share that because I, and it's a powerful piece that happened two months ago was that. I was injured with a second and third degree burn. 
the reason why it happened was I I released something three days before that has something to do with my math teacher in school, and he was discouraging me in school, but it affected actually my financial part of my life, which I wasn't aware of that he created something in my subconscious mind that was not able to. I was always feeling adoptees can feel that I'm not enough, Mm -hmm. but I was always feeling that I was never having enough or I was afraid not having enough. So that day, I released it three days before, but when the burn happened, it happened because I wasn't able to open up or release the anger that I had in my life for all the things that I've been experiencing in life. Right. So that's important thing that we, we suppress the anger because we're not able to speak up. But I wasn't able to release that anger before two months ago because there was so much in it. I didn't speak for 40 years. So I had suppressed the anger and not being able to speak it for 40 years. But that came out two months ago, and that's why I was being able to heal from it. I'm still healing. It's still part of my journey. I'm releasing the anger right now, but by the forgiveness. There you go. So I just wanted to add that last piece into this. But, you know, when the student is ready, the, the teacher will appear. Or it's so, so on, true. Yeah, or we can release the, the trauma or the wound, you know, who they have. Correct. Absolutely correct on all accounts. It's it's so true. And as as people who are helpers or coaches or teachers or mentors, um, we know that if the student isn't quite ready, it's not for us to ram something down somebody's throat. And, nope. you know, we can see perhaps where we've tried. And that's a whole different story about boundaries, et cetera, et cetera. Exactly. But it it is just a beautiful way to be mindful of knowing okay, this is now their time. Maybe they need to digest something or maybe they're not ready. Maybe they have to wait a whole nother lifetime. Maybe it's not even in this lifetime that they can do this, what they think that they're ready for. Um, But the people that you're working with and that I'm working with, when you're ready to be ready and to go to that next level, whatever that level might be, and we may not even know what's around our corner, but you know, the universe has our back. It goes right back to the beginning of what you were saying about um, no accidents and being that I'll add that we can be grateful for all of these moments, even yeah. whether it's a burn or this or this, what is it teaching me and what's around the next corner? And it's, yeah. that's where it's so fun and captivating. Yeah. And there's a lesson in everything we experience in life, right? Right. Absolutely. Well, Ranjana, thank you so much. Where can people find you? And tell us again about your book. Where can we find that? So <clears throat> I'm just going to show it to people. Uh, Good. My yes. book. So um, you can find it on Amazon. Uh, if you type in it, the title, One Voice, Empowering Life Lessons it's about Adoption, you can find it on Amazon. It's also on Danish. Does any Danish listen on here on the call? <clears throat> I don't know. But I assume you're worldwide. Um, there's a Danish website called Saxo.com where they also can buy it in Denmark. It's a little bit too expensive to ship it all the way to the U.S. So I recommend people here in you know in North America they can order it on Amazon and uh, have it shipped to them. Or uh, it, there's also a Kindle version mm-hmm. they can buy if they want to read it on a computer or, no, or iPad. Then people can connect with me on Instagram. Or on Facebook, on LinkedIn, um, all those three channels. I'm also on TikTok, but it is a different. I create a different business on that one. So, uh, but that's where people can can you know connect with me. And I also have if there's anyone that's listening out here that's in foster care or adoptees, I do have an adoption live um, talk show that I do where I'm sharing uh, empowering stories uh, because I want people to you know connect, but also share their story and open up for their voice. So share whatever they, they feel they want to share under the height. So if there's anyone out there, they can reach out to me and I would love to have them on my show. Well, here's this little surprise. So do you have your own podcast or YouTube or tell, tell us more about your show? I started up a couple of years ago while I left Denmark. I started up having a, a weekly adoption live talk show on every Thursday. 
And I just invite adoptees so that time worldwide to tune in and share their story. And I record it afterwards. It's, it's live on Facebook, but now okay. afterwards I record it and upload it on YouTube. Great. Unfortunately, Facebook started to create a oh, lot of they, rules about yep. how we speak, what we speak about. So I can't speak about um, racial. I can't speak about sexual abuse or assault for that case. That They will stop my video so it can be shown. So right now I'm rebranding my adoption live talk show. I think I'm going to turn it over to YouTube instead mm -hmm. of and just do live YouTube videos instead of and do my adoption live talk show there. I am in the process of building a podcast and uh, I'm probably going to launch within one to three months uh, from right. now on. So, but onto that, it will be a very organic, you know, conversation on, on YouTube where we can share stories. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And we're going to have all this information in the show notes. So um, people listening, you can see it in writing where to find Rajana. So thank you. Thank you once again. What a beautiful, beautiful episode. And it's so beautiful because we traverse some very um, scary topics that in such a light way, and I mean light, mm, I won't get off topic. I'm just saying it's beautiful because it's from that resonant heart. And again, there's a way for everybody and everybody can find their way. Yes. Yes. Thank you. And thanks again for listening, everybody. Please be sure to like, follow, review, and share this show. This is Lasting Conversations. We get to the heart of everything. 